I've been in Guantanamo Bay for two years until an actual lawyer rang me for the first time. That would have been December 2003. And he was a, a US military Pentagon appointed lawyer, someone that I didn't choose. And he came to see me just before Christmas of 2003 with a civilian lawyer that was representing me and my family from Adelaide. Uh, up until then, I had had no contact with any legal representative. No one had ever talked to me, any detainee, about charges or commissions or court. We were just led to believe that we'd even be released and we'd die there. In 2004, I was charged. I was one of six detainees at 800 to be charged. We were charged under new laws that were so-called laws that were created specifically and only for detainees at Guantanamo Bay under the jurisdiction of a military commission, something else that existed nowhere else except Guantanamo Bay, who were charged with laws that were so-called laws that weren't recognised by any system or jurisdiction or court in the world. I was charged with one attempted murder by an unprivileged belligerent. And what they meant by that is that I was near somebody who attempted to shoot someone in the Northern Alliance, that meant I was somehow implicated. Under international law, it is not illegal to partake in hostilities. It is what you do in hostilities, if it's a criminal act or not. What the Americans were literally saying is that to partake in hostilities, in legitimate self-defence, or even if you were in the vicinity of where self-defence was being applied, that it was actually uh, an illegal act. This uh, unprivileged belligerent, no legal expert had ever come across the term before. Again, it had been designed for Guantanamo Bay. The second charge was conspiracy. There is such a law, but not conspiracy on its own. You've got to conspire to actually do something. In this sense, it was just conspiracy. But to do what? It didn't matter. We're done with the charge of conspiracy. And the third one was aiding the enemy. And what the Americans meant by that, the only person or the only body that can charge someone with aiding the enemy is your own government because it's similar to a treason law. So what the Americans were basically saying is because Australia is an ally of America, then all Australians owe an allegiance to America and to be even remotely hinted in possibly being engaged with US forces, I am aiding the enemy or I am... Uh, committing treason against the United States because I'm an Australian citizen and I am them in allegiance, as we all do apparently. They get angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. So the enemy were then defined as Al-Qaeda, were they? Yes. Or Taliban or, or foreign volunteer militias and terrorists. The umbrella was terrorists. With the attempted murder by an unprivileged belligerent, the US government had acknowledged that I actually had never fired a shot at anyone or attempted to, but somehow they still managed to justify the charge anyway. Then, for the first time since I'd been in Guantanamo Bay, after five and a half years, John Howard made a public announcement that if I was not charged for a second time, by February of 2007, he was going to officially request my repatriation. He'd never, ever done that before. And I believe I received that news from memory in January. So there was like a month. Uh, yes, George Bush and Congress, Congress had passed the 2006 Military Commissions Act uh, some months before, but no one had been charged. And I could not possibly imagine them charging me in a month because things moved so slowly that I thought that was it. John Howard is only saying that in preparation, knowing I was going home. And I fully believed for the first time I was going home. One day, the medics, I was having stomach problems at the time. And I was taking daily medication for stomach pains. And it was about four o'clock in the afternoon, the medics came every day. But on one day at around this time, the medics gave me a liquid. They offered me a bottle of liquid for my stomach. And I said, but what's this? Because I usually take a tablet. They said, it's called a GI cocktail. Take it, it would be good for your stomach. So I drank it. 
within 10 minutes, I was so tired, I couldn't keep my eyes open, and I basically passed out on the bed. Then only maybe a few minutes passed, and I was woken by a loud banging on my door, and through the slit through the window you can see through, I saw a really large crowd outside the door. So I managed to sort of half get up. I was very, very, very groggy. So I knew I'd been drugged with that liquid. And they said, we're here to formally charge you. Do you want us to do it here or do you want to go to a private room? So I managed to say, no, no, let's go to a private room. And then these two guys in civilian clothes read me two new charges. This time around, one was attempted murder based on my apparently being in a war zone and in close proximity to other people who are aiming small arms fire at the Northern Alliance. Like a guilt by association type of thing. And the second one was material support to terrorism. Though it didn't state how it ever supported terrorism though. Nevertheless, those were the two charges. And after having those two charges read to me, I was taken back to my room and then I slept really heavily for a long time after. A few days later, I had a... Uh, my military lawyer came to confirm that, yes, I'd been charged. And it was at that point that I thought, now I'm committing suicide. Because he didn't believe that the US was going to go through the military commissions, my lawyers. They thought, it seemed, because the five-year anniversary for Guantanamo had just happened, and it seemed to be that every time there was a large public outcry about Guantanamo Bay, the US government would respond in return. And there was no better way by doing so than charging someone and saying, look at the type of people or supposedly don't forget the type of evil terrorist we have here. You know, why are you supporting them? And yet when it came to the crunch for, you know, to test these allegations, they never went ahead with it. But it didn't matter because they achieved their goals with the propaganda of just merely charging us and going on about it in the media. So my lawyers thought, look, we're looking at another three years. We're going to have to put the federal court, appeals court and Supreme Court. <laughs> Another three years, and I thought that's it. All of a sudden, my lawyers came running into the room really excitedly while I was speaking with my father, and they put a piece of paper in, in my face. And it was that if I said guilty to material support to terrorism, I would have to stay in Guantanamo no more later than 60 days and then I can be released back to Australia. However, I would have to serve a further seven months in the Australian prison. That is, I would have to remain in prison till after the 07 elections, and then I could be released. You know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't keen on this at first. You know, to say guilty to an offence you haven't committed, to say guilty to a terrorism offence, you know, that's, that's a big deal. And, you know, as desperate, as desperate as I was, you know, it's not, I'm just not going to, you know, in my cell, in my room alone, I may have said, oh, I'll say guilty to anything. I don't give a shit. You know, I did September 11th. You might have to cut that out. But I, uh, I'll do it. But when it comes to the crunch, like, you don't jump to these things so quickly. But uh, it was hard because for the first time in five and a half years, Someone's actually said to me, you've only got 60 days to do, mate, and you're gone. And that's never happened. And I knew that this was serious, that it wasn't a joke, that it could happen. And that if I didn't take it, I'd have to kill myself because I'd be there for years going through the court system again. And, you know, it was a real struggle. And I asked to speak with, uh, with my father and my sister alone about the lawyers. You know, I said to them, look, you know, because they sort of wanted, they supported me in whatever I wanted to do. But they just wanted to get me out of it. They were concerned for my health and, and whatnot. But, I, you know, I said, well, I'm going to say guilty to terrorism. Australian media, you know, they will never, they will never forget this, you know. It will be a stigma that will be attached to me forever. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing done. And they, uh, you know, when I looked into my father's eyes, I thought, you know, after everything you'd done, I just can't go and kill myself maybe. So we called the lawyers back in and... I said, all right, I'll do it. But it wasn't as simple as that, though. For example, I thought I just had to go, because I only had to say guilty to material support to terrorism anyway. So I, if I had to throw that murder thing in there, I wouldn't have done it. 
But for material, what, what, what's material for terrorism? Who gives a shit? I'll just say guilty and just to get out of there. However, I went into the commission room that day and I said guilty. And then I found out that I had to go back and say guilty to all these detailed uh, allegations. I didn't know about that. And that was a real struggle because what I really wanted to do was what the world's media was at the military commission was to yell out all the shit that they'd been doing to me all this time and how much I wanted a fair chance and a real court and all the disadvantages against me, you know, stuck about day-to-day -day survival. And I'm not in any uh, frame of mind to defend myself. I'm too busy trying to survive down it, you know, but instead I just stood there and said and said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And a few times I, you know, found it hard to say that and I was just going to get angry and, you know, he's like, fuck you, and start going on about all the torture and stuff. But, you know, I just, it's that fear thing. It's, you know, it's the interrogators, it's, it's torture. And I just went ahead and kept saying, yes, sir. And then uh, it was all over and David was the guilty terrorist and I'm sitting back in my Guantanamo cell doing my last 60 days. And then I got paranoid that, They'd come up with some excuse and I'd be stuck there anyway and I wouldn't come back to Australia and then I'd be stuck with the stigma of guilty and then the support wouldn't be as strong and all these, you know, that messed with my head. But, and then came the last day, or the 58th day, and my lawyer came to, you know, let me know, right, you're going tomorrow. But the Australian consular official came with him and he came with a document and it was a mirror image basically of what I've signed and it was saying that I'd entered into his disagreement uh, with my full you know, capacity and I knew what I was doing and I'm happy with the advice and good frame of mind and all this type of thing. I wasn't forced or coerced or duress into it and all this stuff. And I said, I'm not signing that. I've just done that already twice. I'm not doing it a third time. I'm not doing it with you. That sounds official. And my military lawyer said, US lawyer said, if you don't do this, he's going oh, no, the, sorry, the consular official said, if I don't sign that, Australia will not take me and I will stay there. And I looked at my military US lawyer. He said, that's true. If you don't sign this as well, you're not going home, even after doing everything required on me. So I had to fucking sign that form as well. And then the next night I was released. When the deal for release in 60 days was first offered, and as explaining, I didn't uh, say yes straight away. I, I did ask the lawyer to try and get time served or to try and get a bit of better deal because uh, I didn't want to continue. I want to leave. If I'm going to say something like guilty to a terrorism offence, I want to go home straight away. I want to get something out of it. I don't want to keep being in prison in those conditions. And uh, the lawyers went and talked to the convening authority who was arranging this plea deal and one of the people involved. And then uh, when they came back, they said, look, they're not going to budge. They're really not happy about, uh, you know, you're the first detainee from here to go for terrorism charges after all this hype about worse of the worst and you're getting seven months, you know what I mean? It's like, they're not real happy, but they're willing to do it because John Howard wants it over sort of thing. However, they did say the one concession they offered is something called an Alfred plea. And it's not something we have here in Australia, but in the US, from my understanding, the Alfred plea basically allowed me to plead not guilty to the allegations, but I was saying that based due to the rules of the military commissions, the way it was rigged and the way it was impossible to win, uh, that I could not win in that system. Uh, so it's allowing me to say guilty without saying I am guilty of the allegations. Uh, something we don't have here is maybe it's hard for Australians to wrap their head around. So I never actually said guilty to the allegation anyway, under the uh, meaning of the uh, definition of the Alfred plea. So and my lawyers thought that was fantastic to get an Alfred plea. So, uh, you know, it didn't mean much to me at the time, to be honest. So, but that's how it turned out. With the uh, plea deal I entered into, there were quite a lot of conditions. Not just the fact that I had to plead guilty to a terrorist offence. Uh, for example, there I had to agree to a one-year gag order where I uh, couldn't disclose uh, any of my experiences whatsoever to anyone, including family and friends. Uh, I had to agree to never challenge uh, my conviction at any time. I had to agree that uh, if I ever left Australian jurisdiction, I could be re-detained by the US military as an enemy combatant. That is to be held indefinitely without charge and without trial and no recourse. 
or no, no chance of no remedy. I had to agree to uh, hand over any uh, profits that I may make from my story to the Australian government. I had to agree to cooperate with Australian and US law officials for the rest of my life. I had to agree that I was uh, never ill-treated, uh, tortured or put under duress by uh, any uh, US employees, including their contractors. I also had to say that I uh, voluntarily entered into the plea agreement.